where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world. Three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games from our childhood to try to take another look at what we fell in love with. As always, I'm Nick, and I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, Tim, and subbing in for Dean once again, our favorite resident, Laura. Hello. Ah, here it goes. You guys remember that one, right? Today, we're going to be discussing Good Burger. I'm a little rusty at this. I think the last time I joined you guys, it was before I had a baby, so it was back in October. So it's been, my my podcasting skills are a little dusty, but oh. I'm so happy to be back. It was uh, Hocus Pocus, right? Yes. I think so. Yep. That's been a minute. Oh. Yeah. Thanks for having me back, guys. And of course, this was a little last minute, but I'm so happy I'm doing it because being able to rewatch Good Burger was surprisingly really fun. So I appreciate the trip back down memory lane. To 1997. I know I mentioned it um, earlier off show that Nick had been talking about Good Burger for a while. I know it's one of the movies he likes. So I watched it years ago and I figured maybe it's one of those things like it's a nostalgia thing of you had to grow up with it. I loved it. And then I rewatched it now for the show. And I still think 90s kids comedies had a certain uniqueness and edge to it that we really don't get now yeah it was like encouraged and, to be weird back then and now everything needs to be very uniform and and clean yeah very clean i i was expecting it to be too silly and while it was extremely silly there were still parts of it that um never really treated the audience like idiots um, and I know that that was something that I had seen once on the Nickelodeon documentary. Uh, they said that Nickelodeon humor differed from Disney humor and that they made the jokes to kids as if they were adults. They didn't baby it down. And I think that's part of what I really enjoyed seeing again in, on this rewatch. Well, so I'm excited to talk about it. I think the difference between Nickelodeon and Disney growing up always felt like Disney was run by like executives who were making programs for kids. Nickelodeon felt like the inmates are running the asylum. It was yeah. kids are running Nickelodeon, even though they weren't. But it's like, oh, we have the Kids' Choice Awards and we have all of these things that are very kid-centric and kid humor that seems more like it's coming from focus groups of children and not focus groups of executives who have children. Exactly. Yeah, the jokes in it, like I tried watching all that again, and that was a lot tougher. The nostalgia did not work for it. I mm-hmm. didn't like watching some of the skits because I remember like, you know, oh, Pierre S. Cargo, he was one of my favorite skits. Or like um Vital Information with Lori Beth Denberg. Like, Back in those, Second Barry. That well, his actually were good. <laughs> I like those skits. But <laughs> a lot of them just didn't I couldn't do it. I really couldn't. And then coming back to this movie, I always felt like that humor wasn't the same. And yeah. it was less just kind of like shock, funny kid humor. And this was more well-rounded general audience humor. And I felt it really, I, I caught myself laughing several times through this because it's just like the audacity of what some of the characters would say. Right. And I, I agree with that. I think it's also to just the nature of the format of how you're consuming it. So with all that, it's a, um, it's a sketch show. You know, it's yeah, it's a sketch show. So it's, yeah, they're all tiny little chunks of humor. So it's going to be in your face and a little bit more insane, whereas this had more structure. Um, and I think there was an overall story. Um, and a a moral that was to be gathered from this, um, which you don't get in a sketch show. So I think that's also helped it in its aging process. I mean, like you said, Nick, as far as going back and rewatching all that, but then I think of all other, like not even kids sketch shows, but just in general, you go back and you watch years of SNL. There's the best of, but every single one is not a hit. 
Like there's a lot of misses in there. I think it's just because of a long enough time frame we remember the hits. Because like, yeah, if you have one great sketch every other show for 30 years, there's going to be a lot of greats out there. I think all that, it's... I'm sure there's kids that will probably watch it and still laugh at some of it now. But yeah, it's not for me other than Bag and Sagenberry. I still laugh at that. It reminded me a lot of a lot of the, like, Wayne's World, Night at the Roxbury, a lot of those SNL turned movie. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, and it and it had that quality to it that SNL provides to all of it. Because it was meant for kids. And, like, even when I heard Keenan Thompson was able to become, you know, a cast member for SNL. Like, you know, I was so proud of him. Like I we grew up watching him and and all that. And he's basically been doing this all his life. So the natural progression and he's like the longest running cast member now. Yeah, but, I think Keenan Thompson's an excellent example of literally watching someone pursue their dream in the public eye and achieving it. And it's really cool to see especially as someone that grew up watching Mighty Ducks and Heavyweights and all that, and knowing that he loved doing sketch comedy. And like you said, he's now the longest running cast member of SNL. There's a lot of speculation that when Lauren retires, he's going to take over the helm. So if that happens, talk about full circle Holy crap, you know. He immediately <laughs> fires be... all the cast and brings back Josh <laughs> Server, Kel Mitchell, Lori Beth Denberg. Listen, Lori Beth Denberg is amazing, and I'm really sad that she never made it onto SNL because she's still very funny. Um, she's quite popular in social was media. She, in? she was in a movie, and I hated how that is how she was it. Or like that's what they used her in. I it think might it was have been a dodgeball. Like, Yes, that's what it was. Like, yeah. she just played the overweight cheerleader to get a gag out of, like, oh, she's going to crush the main, the, the nerdy main character. It just, it was so disheartening to see that, like, that's the one that she got picked for because I felt she was a bigger celebrity than she realizes because of how many people used to watch her every single week on all that. She does have a fairly significant social media presence now. And I know that she also is a regular at the 90s cons. It seems like there's a little bit more of a comeback. And from what I understand, you guys might know more about this than I do. I believe there is a, a Good Burger remake coming. Um, I wonder if she would have any involvement in that. I think that would be kind of neat. Because it's it's going to be the return sequel, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in reference to the sequel, um, for the sequel, I did see some posts lately that they converted a Friendly's restaurant somewhere in Rhode Island into a Good Burger. Yep. Those sweet, sweet tax breaks uh, on the East Coast for filming must really be coming in handy. I was so. actually, I saw that pop up recently of like filming in the area. Um, and I was going to actually message you, Nick, and be like, do you want to just go crash the Good Burger 2 set? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they're still filming this weekend, we'll just crash it. They always have the cool pop-up restaurants in LA and shit. Like when they did like the movie, uh, yeah. um, like the thing, like I, I wanted to check that out so bad and there's like a couple other ones like can we get some for the east coast can we get good burger please yeah yeah we had the peach pit at one point which was pretty cool and some others but bringing up movies the entire time watching this i was just thinking this feels so much like a spiritual precursor to what we got with like part of clerks 2 or even the the mondo versus good burger thing felt very globo gym versus average joe's from dodgeball like it's it's so much that i think about now that yeah it, it kind of really came off of good burger even though it's not a very it's a tale as old as time it's like the old save the rec center kind of movie david and goliath for sure oh yeah that one's older a little bit a little bit older <laughs> nick when did you first see this i saw it in theaters i did too actually i remember seeing it tim you did not see it in theaters <laughs> no no <laughs> I did not. I saw it about uh, five years ago on my couch. <laughs> you really missed an experience. Hey, I mean... it was still good. I ordered a bunch <laughs> of burgers and I just watched this. I remember <laughs> before the movie, it had like an Action League Now skit, like how Disney will do like cartoon shorts before the actual movie. 
they did the same thing and they did action league now and i remember sitting in the theater and basically saying that whole like intro that they do for action league now like it's the flesh he's super strong and super naked you know, thunder girl she flies like thunder and my mom looks at me and she's like how the fuck do you know all this stuff already <laughs> she didn't know that it was based on a skit on nickelodeon yeah also i'd be curious to know if anyone that worked on action league now had a, a later career in adult swim because it felt like in retrospect it had that similar offbeat wacky humor so I could I, I mean, could see there being some sort of relation there. I think Kablam as a whole was just very of its time in terms of just the randomness of humor and just taking. I loved '90s Nickelodeon because we got stuff like Adventures of Pete and Pete. We got Kablam. We got all of these shows that just encouraged writers and creators to just be weird. That's fine. Like we're gonna take a chance on anything that you guys do. And now mm -hmm. it seems like it, unless you have something that's going to hit the the widest viewpoints or like for uh, watchability or all of this, they're not going to give you a full season. There's way too much analytics and it's not anything to deal with creativity because we're dealing with Disney remake after Disney remake. There's nothing new. And I get that because there's been like shots where like, oh, nobody makes anything new anymore. You know, they're just remaking Star Wars again, and they're just doing another sci-fi thing that we've seen again for like the hundredth time. It's like, well, do you remember Jupiter Ascending? That was supposed to be something new, and we just threw it away. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't great either. And there's been more franchises built off of something that was a lot less in back in the 80s and stuff that still we watch today. Yeah. Like John Carpenter of Mars was... Or, uh, was John Carpenter. Oh, John, 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 I would watch that. Um, John <laughs> Carter of Mars. Yeah, that's the one. Like, I know that's based on a book, right? But that didn't go anywhere. Ender's Game, that's another one. But I know they're based on books, but that's still at least something that can be developed into something that can be franchised into for the future. But no, it doesn't go anywhere. So, I mean, it's kind of frustrating. But yeah, like a lot of TV now is just so curated to the point of like, they've checked every statistic possible that I am supposed to like this. And it just doesn't feel as organic and natural compared to a group of writers just spitballing and literally creating something out of thin air. What's frustrating too, is I feel as though, as opposed to what we had growing up, the current landscape of television, actual cable live TV is a little bit of a hellscape. I, I just looked it up. The, Nickelodeon TV guide it's pretty much all Spongebob until 10 o'clock and then it's all friends overnight and um, you know I think not having variety in the shows that you're airing also really discourages any sort of creativity um, or uniqueness in that content and I know it's not just Nickelodeon I mean MTV literally should be the ridiculousness channel it's all they show is like ridiculousness and catfish props to the the host of ridiculousness to be able to do that because yeah. he manipulated them like he was the fucking senate I mean yeah. he palpatined his way to the top of MTV and it's literally his channel because you're right that's all they play nowadays whenever you want to watch ridiculousness just turn it on MTV there's a 90% chance it's going to be playing I mean yeah. I think it's because it's even though it may be enjoyable, it's low risk, low effort content. It's we're going to do a clip show of showing and reacting to other people's clips and content. So it's not a lot of money they need to put into to producing things. It's just put a bunch of people in a room, put a microphone and they have them talk about something that they're watching. Oh, that's us right now. But still, like it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's got a little meta. It's got meta. Yeah. <laughs> but it ends up being the what can we do that will cost us the least amount of money, get us the most watchers? And then in the case of now, it's we don't care about cable anymore. It's kind of dead at this point. For years, yeah. it's been kind of going into the streaming wars, and now streaming is starting to turn into these weird bundles of things of, oh, you want your Hulu and your Disney Plus together and your Amazon and Showtime and HBO and Cinemax and we're going the route of cable again, where it's going to end up being now we're getting rid of the old analytics. And now it's going to be, if you don't watch this entire season within the first two days, then it's considered a loss for our network. And we need to come up with a new streaming plan. Yeah. The only benefit I think that is still 
outstanding with the switch to streaming is the options you have to stream without ads. Yeah. And I am perfectly happy. I know people complain, you know, depending on how many streaming services you get, you're still paying the same that you would for cable. Yes, that might be true, except with this, I don't have to watch ads. And when I go to a hotel and I turn on the TV, it's almost unwatchable because it's pretty much all commercials. Well, then it's so, the thing yeah. that I like about the streaming, at least, is I'm not locked into a contract. So if I decide I want to get Netflix this month, watch all the stuff I've wanted to watch, and then, I mean, I still keep it, but if I wanted to then get rid of it and move on to something else, I'm not locked into this cable contract of like, mm, you have to pay a, a breakup fee or whatever. Otherwise, you have to stay with us for X amount of time, which as soon as streaming services start doing contracts like that, where they no longer offer a month by month or something, but I don't think they'll <laughs> we come go that full route. circle. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Full circle. Yeah. I think for children's entertainment, I'm not as familiar, admittedly, with the content that you can find on Netflix or Hulu. But I would imagine you will be. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I I imagine it probably. I I would assume, especially for Netflix, probably does take more risks. Um, I know Netflix is a little notorious for green lighting everything and its mom, and then cutting it after two seasons. But I would imagine that a lot of the children's content is probably more adventurous than something you would find on Nickelodeon today. Um, I thought I heard Cartoon Network was going away completely, which breaks my heart. Oh, that true? would be sad. I, I feel like I read about that somewhere. Although last time I had cable, I, I still saw it floating around, but that They're would be They're probably just trying to find a, a streaming platform to attach themselves to. Because yeah. I know Adult Swim attached themselves to HBO Max or formerly HBO Max. Now it's just Max. Yeah. Um, I, they're probably trying to do the same thing. For all we know, they probably hook up with Paramount later on or just put all of their stuff on that. But just niche content that it's just probably for its own dedicated streaming service. They probably jumped on that bandwagon and then realized it's we're not making enough money. And the smaller stuff I get, but it's the bigger companies where it's just they're starting to sacrifice shows because, oh, they're not deemed popular. Like hearing the big uh, like cuts that Disney Plus is doing for a lot of their content. It's like, dude, we're only watching your stuff to see the new Star Wars, to watch the new Marvel thing that I didn't get to see in theaters. And then I'm cutting your service. I'm not watching it anymore. There's not who want. I know people watch certain things religiously constantly, but I feel a lot of the streaming services don't have enough content to constantly go back to every single day to watch something new. A lot of most consumers don't look at it that way. I know I'm not really there yet, but I know specifically for Disney, Disney is always going to have, every parent in the world in a stranglehold for content <laughs> yeah um, as it is you know i i know that this will be a bluey household uh pretty soon it's a pretty good show bluey is, is amazing actually yeah i'm really happy that that's the one children's show that i'm very much aware of uh at this point and it is amazing um but yeah i think like totally get your point nick about you know how probably a lot of folks just stay tuned for the Star Wars and Marvel content and bail. But I do know that particularly for children's content uh, at this point, you just play dancing vegetables ad nauseum for hours at a time. Also pretty <laughs> and, good. Well, I don't, I don't mean specifically yeah. just Disney in particular, because I mean, right. for parents, there's a whole different subsection of content that you won't personally consume on a regular basis because right. you can't sell like Stranger Things, how many times are you going to possibly watch it? Like, yeah, right. I know some people are utter fans and they watch it at least like five, six times per season, if not even more than that. I get that. But on an average consumer level, I don't expect them to be like, oh, they're watching Stranger Things again. It's like whenever you go into like that movie and like the hacker guy always has some like random thing playing in the background, like not everyone's <laughs> like that where they're always going to have like a Godzilla film playing. Or like Powerpuff Girls happens to be on in the background. And that's the, just the thing. It's always going to be there whenever you walk in the room. Not everyone's like that. Well, I think also it's just because we have access to more content that it's become this oversaturation 
that nowadays it's easier to make things and you don't need a studio backing necessarily because you can do things independently or you can do things because of ease of equipment access or all of these other processes or people being able to do more of that do-it-yourself stuff and then getting snapped up by all the streaming services that are desperately trying to vie for having more things to constantly give people they can't mm -hmm. necessarily just rely anymore on we have that one great show on our network that you come to watch well that's great but after you're done binging that you will drop it unless they constantly say well yeah but next week we have these 10 things and then forget that because the week after we have these other 10 things so it becomes this just oversaturation of i can't keep up like i don't have time to go back and rewatch stranger things season one again because there's 15 other shows coming out every minute right i think right now the only streaming service that i truly just pick up and put down is apple tv um, I feel like the other streamers have done a pretty good job with maintaining my attention with various different choices. Um, especially Hulu's biggest thing I like is that they have the next day streaming. So that's what keeps me with them. And then, yeah, Netflix just always has something. But yeah, Apple TV, I'm not there yet. I'm all either Shutter or Crunchyroll. Um but I'm also a hypocrite because I have all the streaming services. <laughs> I complain for about them and pay for them. So you said Crunchyroll, now I want sushi. So. Hey, it's it's a great streaming network. <laughs> what is what's their primary? Is, is it uh, anime? Or yeah, it's all anime. Is, okay. Yeah, I'm not for, as familiar with them. Shutter um, for horror, Crunchyroll for anime. Yeah, horror is also not not my thing uh you guys won't find me on don't open this podcast anytime soon although plug for that great podcast <laughs> that i will have nothing to add to that ever i wasn't gonna plug it <laughs> tim that's your only plug that's it you only you're only getting one tonight so please listen. Listen. it was, it was from me no 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 <laughs> <laughs> although it should be like for like you should give us a shout out now I do. Next episode. I say, oh. See me on our sister podcast, Screen Refresh or Rule of Thirds. Oh, this is the sister. I love that for me to be on the sister podcast. I don't know. Nobody ever says like, oh, see us on our brother show or see us on our brother network. It's always like sister network, sister show. I don't know why. It's like the boat principle. People always name their boats or refer to their boats in the feminine. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody like so. walks out and sees a schooner and they're like, he's a beaut. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so good burger it was released back in july 25th 1997 directed by brian robbins and good burger was adapted to the big screen as we mentioned before from that popular skit show all that that played mid to late 90s so if you've never seen it it's basically just kids version of snl it's a skit show where the cast is it's performed by a cast of teenagers that a weekly musical guest just like uh snl and it was extremely popular for us millennials i'm sure maybe gen x watched it but it was definitely like meant for you know our age range so i'm not going to go too much into the numbers because good burger is not the type of movie that's going to be smashing its way through the box office so Good Burger made about 23 million. I didn't actually look up the budget only because I thought it was really interesting that it opened against Air Force One, which dethroned Men in Black for the number one spot since its release in July 4th. And I can't find that website again, but I was marveled on the fact that that top 10 list for the summer of 97 Every single one of those is a massive movie you absolutely will recognize. And it's like, if you can go back in time and see like the best movies ever, this is the time to do it. Because I'm pretty sure Con Air was in there. The Lost World Jurassic Park was in that list. Huge movies all in this one like six to ten week block. Yeah, because just in July alone, after Men in Black hit, I mean, not a blockbuster, but we got like Contact we got George of the Jungle, um, Air Force One, and then July closed out with Spawn. No, I, I was I was talking bigger than that. Bigger than Spawn? Let me see if I can... Bigger than George of the Jungle. Fuck Spawn. <laughs> hey, hey, there's another bigger than George of the Jungle. That's Brendan we're talking about. Um, So you guys know what else came out in 1997? 
Wild America? Spice World. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't find the exact day that it released right off the bat, but 90, let's just say 97 was a good year. So I mean, I still love all of the 90s. I think 99 was such a great year for movies because I think mm-hmm. we talked about it at some point that 99 – they didn't know if the world was going to end, so they were just green lighting every project they can think of. Ah, uh, yes, Y two K. Those were the days. We need another end of day scenario where they're just like, <laughs> any stupid idea you have, here's three million dollars, make it. I don't know. It didn't really work out with COVID, so <laughs> true. Well, I mean, did we, we didn't know did that we was get coming. any good? Did we get any good creative uh, fruits? of labor out of the COVID era, would you guys say? I know this is a little bit of a departure, but I'm just curious. I really like that um, Karen Gillian movie, and it had Pedro Pascal in it. And it was like... Oh, the bubble? You know, they were try- yeah, I really liked that one. That was funny. I didn't see that. I liked, yeah. uh, I think it was Helldiver. It's like a... It's on, it's on Netflix. This other one's on Man. Shutter. Yeah, I'm not sure. I just remember Tiger King. Was, but that was made prior to COVID. It's just what everyone watched during lockdown. So I'm pretty sure that was Stockholm Syndrome, though. <laughs> Accurate. Named after Stockholm, okay. Sweden. Yeah, I, I feel out of the loop on the blockbuster season for this year. Um, I know that the big ones were obviously Guardians and Fast 10, and I haven't seen either of those yet. Cocaine Bear. So we have Men in Black, <laughs> Face Off, Contact, Hercules, My Best Friend's Wedding, Georgia the Jungle, Air Force One, Out to Georgia Sea, the Jungle, Nothing to Lose, Batman and Robin, Con Air, Speed Two, Cruise Control, Good Burger, Operation Condor, this was all that the Lost summer? World, Oh my God, Anaconda, Liar Liar, <laughs> Spawn, The Fifth Element. Yeah, like Damn. these are like huge names. Like, wow, this is amazing. And this is spread out across like May to July. But still, like some of these, this is like box office for 97. For July, um, number one was Men in Black. And then when Air Force One came out, it topped the the box office for it. But only for opening weekend. Because at that point, it already been out since July 2nd. And Air Force One came out July 25th. So it took three weeks for men in black to be dethroned yeah Mm -hmm. which at that point it's like three weeks in who hadn't seen men in black that year yeah because men in black made in that website it just said like two hundred fifty thousand dollars was or 250 million (laughs) wow that's rough i guess because like what else would you do at that point like going to the movies was huge it was still I mean, yeah. I know a lot of people no still go to the movies, but yeah, when there's no streaming, you know, nobody had cell phones. Like, what did we do? I don't like we I went to the mall and lots. loitered, <laughs> loitered at the mall, sat in the back of went cars and parking lots, pretty much. So who directed this again? Did he direct anything else? Um, Ready to Rumble was the my, was yeah. my takeaway from it. Wait, Brian mm-hmm. Robbins did Ready to Rumble? Oh, wow. So he originally was the the co-creator and executive producer on all that, uh, okay. 94 to 2005. He also was involved on Keenan and Kel. He did later stuff as executive producer for like One Tree Hill, Smallville. Um, he directed Varsity Blues. Oh, that's where Spatch was too. Yep, Ron Lester, which then his character of, was it Billy Ray or something? I forget. Billy if, Bob. I think. Yeah, I think Billy Bob. Or was it Billy Ray? I think Billy Bob might have been his character in Varsity Blues, but then he played, I think, Billy Ray in Not Another Teen Movie, parodying <laughs> his own character from Varsity Blues. Not Another Teen Movie, I think, might deserve an episode. Is it far back enough in time that it could qualify I mean, or I, is it too new? I would think so. I watched it in the past couple of years. There's certain things that don't hold up. Um, oh, no. Yeah. But there are still things that I laugh at, like when they yeah. do the Rudy parody and they take that kid in half on the football field. Who let him play? <laughs> it's such. It, I just I remember it being a great movie, but yeah, I'm sure with a rewatch, I'll have several moments. <laughs> but, um, also, Brian Robbins, if anybody didn't know in 2018 he became the president of nickelodeon 
and in 2019, he became the president of Kids and Family Entertainment at Viacom. Oh. Our boy's moving Viacom... on up. So he, he owns... Wait, Viacom owns Nickelodeon, too? It's uh, I think so, yeah. Yes. Oh. I just remember the end of shows being like, Viacom. Yeah. Very interesting. So our cast list is... um. I think kind of small. So we have obviously, you know, Kel Mitchell and Keenan Thompson playing Ed and Dexter, respectively. We have a random Abe Vigoda coming in as the fry cook, Otis. I haven't seen him in much else, and I know I'm going to butcher his last name. So we have our villain, Kurt, played by Jan Schweiderman. Is it I haven't Jan? really. Yeah, or it could be. Yeah. Um, I really haven't. I've looked him up, too. He really wasn't really in anything after yeah. or before this. And then uh, there's a lot of cameos in it, but the only one that I feel deserves the mention here is going to be the teacher, Mr. Wheat, who's voiced by Sinbad. Or not, not voiced, but he is Sinbad. <laughs> Sinbad dubbed his own lines because it was him. It was him. <laughs> I I do want to call out, because um, I'm probably the only one that cares about this. Shaq. I, I knew. <laughs> no, actually, Char. <laughs> Char, Char Jackson. Oh yeah, Monique. Um, she played. Yeah, she played Monique. So I, I knew I had recognized her, and I thought, where do I know her from? And it was actually from the tabloids. She was all over the tabloids because she had two children with Kevin Federline prior to Kevin Federline having children with Britney Spears. So there was a lot of that yep. drama. So I was like, where do I know her from? That's kind of a bummer that I recognize her more from that rather than a movie that I actually paid money to see her in um, or that I paid to see money. You know, I paid money to see <laughs> it and see she was money? in it. <laughs> <laughs> Love to see money. Um, I, yeah, I, I felt kind of bad that that's the, the legacy is the, the baby drama, but that's just a fun little fact on Char Jackson. Also fun fact, Linda Cardinelli's first film. Really? Mm -hmm. It was her feature she film was great. debut. Oh yeah, Heather. Heather is just standout character. Loved it. She was just a little baby in this. It's bonkers to me how they get Abe Vigoda to play in this, because I love the fact that Abe Vigoda is like he was in the Godfather trilogy. He was in Batman: Mask of the Phantasm. He's in all of these things over the years, and then he's Otis the Fry Cook in this. But it's doesn't come. <laughs> it doesn't end up coming across as like he's slumming it for that paycheck. It's like. No, Abe Vigoda is putting in a fun performance in this movie that ends up elevating the whole thing. Yeah. He's got like six lines in it and each one is gold. I still die every time where he's just like, gets up off the ground. I think I broke my ass. I love that line. <laughs> hey, who yeah. are you? Your mama. What are you doing? <laughs> I, I wrote every uh, quote that really made me laugh out loud. I mean, I... I you know, giggled at a lot of things, but that was one of the quotes that I actually laughed out loud. It was really good. I realized I had to stop just writing quotes that I thought were funny because at midway through the movie, I'm like, there are so many lines that I was not expecting that I just love. And it, the, I'm just going to end up writing out most of the script if I just continue doing that. I do want to call out one more cameo too, which was Carmen Electra. And I want to call out her cameo. I guess it was more of a role because she had a speaking part. But um, I want to call that out because I think that's when the train of nostalgia hit me the hardest. Because in one scene, she's wearing powder blue, shiny eyeshadow and drinking a Fruitopia yep. at <laughs> golf course. When I saw that, the course. only thing I could think of was, wow, here are two things that never left the 90s. <laughs> Man, I remember Fruitopia. <laughs> so I thought, wow, I have that in common with Carmen Electra. I, too, used to wear powder blue eyeshadow and drink Fruitopia. Also, and bless Carmen Electra for being like this wonderful superstar model or whatever during that time. And then still doing all of these roles where she is genuinely just like, that's fine. I'll just do a dumb character that people will laugh at. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I did like the cover of Roxanne that played whenever she was on screen. That was good. Mm -hmm. Also, can we, when can we talk about the movie? The I'm a Dude song. <laughs> <I was gonna laughs> say, the Ska I'm a Dude. Oh, rendition. with less than Jake? 
Oh my gosh, that it's song slaps. <laughs> it slaps. I I mean, that's talk about another nostalgia train there is ska. I mean, I'm waiting for ska to really come back. I mean, this I was at the, the height of like little Tim just playing Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 to listen oh, to yeah. Goldfinger. The, yeah. I'm surprised this song wasn't in Tony Hawk. It would have fit. It, it would have. It's honestly, I enjoy it very much. But I also, you know, did listen to Big D and I listened to Real Big Fish and all those. I, I know Ska is not for everyone, but I, think this, I love the song. The album, uh, like the, the motion picture album for Good Burger, I want to say it was like 101 on the Billboard charts or something like that. I know it ended up charting on the Billboard tops um, when mm-hmm. this came out. You know, last night, was it last night that I saw you or the night before? <laughs> Time's a flat circle. Yeah. Uh, um, I actually listened to it on the way to your house. <laughs> I couldn't find that song on Spotify. I was sad. I can only find it on YouTube. Um, the song um, Do Fries Go With That Shake gets stuck in my head every now and then. <laughs> I felt like, you know, I think it's about time I listened to it from start to finish. I mean, I really liked the dance segment to Knee Deep by the Funkadelic with George Clinton. Oh, my gosh. Yes. That was fantastic. Not to be confused with Dean's favorite, George S. Clinton from the Mortal Kombat soundtrack. <laughs> We've now well, done the reversal of that it. joke. I'm sorry, I can't add color to that joke. I will continue our basketball trend, though, and I will say that, you know, speaking of real big fish, the only real exposure I had to them was from basketball, and they did a really good cover of um, Take On Me by Aha. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah, great and, version. And that's that's the first time I heard the song, too. So when I heard the original one, I'm like, I thought it, I felt it was slower in comparison to, like, that upbeat ska that they brought to the table instead. Still good, but... I do always like the real big first fit the real big fish version better. I think there was also I think Mighty Mighty Boss Tones were in Clueless, right? That was another ska mm, possibly appearance. I think so. Yeah. Wait, like so. actual appearance or their song appearing in the film? No, I think they were like playing at the club. Yeah, the the club thing that they I, go to, right? I miss the days yeah. of those nineties and early two thousands comedies where they're just like randomly there's a scene where they end up at some sort of show and there's just a band playing. Like, yeah. oh, we have Scooby Doo playing uh, Sugar Ray. Yeah, or like the offspring in Idle Hands, or uh, like, what was it Smash Mouth at the end of Rat Race or something? Mm-hmm. Um, Sixpence on the Richer was in one too. I'm trying to remember which That's movie a it was. Cut. Yeah, I remember they were in one. It might have been She's All That. Shit, I can't remember. I should watch that recently. I Again, the... I really like that one. Honestly, I think the last time I saw a band do that was Fall Out Boy and Sex Drive. That was back and in even 06. that now has been ten years ago, at least. That was 06. I mean, two, that was mid, 06. like mid two no. thousands is still a good cutoff. Yeah, I think Sex Drive was 06. Sex Drive was 09. Oh, okay. Or oh wait. Well, I thought you googled it. Oh no 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 no! I'm just I'm going by memory. Are you kidding me? He's timing it. I think we went and saw that together. Two thousand eight. It was 08. Okay. Um, I originally rented it from Blockbuster once it released when I was working at the one up in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, or rather, technically, I think it was New Britain, Connecticut, but still. Funny. I thought that was one yeah. of those stupid, raunchy comedies that came out. That's just like the, the schlock that Blockbuster would get. It, it wasn't good. Massive. I mean, I, I liked it. Yeah, there I was stuff it was actually in it really that I thought comparison. was funny. There's still a lot of stupid stuff. I think oh. one of my favorite things is seeing James Marsden do comedy in that of him like angry and then finding out that his car got stolen. And he's like, I think it was like riding his motorcycle towards the garage, jumps off of it and just lets the bike go running as he just like runs towards the garage as he's screaming. And I just thought, James Marsden, you're pretty funny. They should let you do more comedy. Well, Dean and I saw him in person on Melrose and Dean well, I saw him and I said, oh, my God, that was James Marsden. And so Dean decided to follow him. He t- literally turned around and followed James into a store to confirm that I was right. And I thought, you look so creepy right now. <laughs> Poor James Marsden. He was just trying to buy some Yeezys or something at like this super expensive shoe store. Did When you saw him, did you tell him that uh, Rachel McAdams should have chosen him in the notebook? No, I will say, though, that dude's cheekbones could cut glass. <laughs> They were, <laughs> they were prominent. 
that's that's the weirdest thing about seeing celebrities is they're just naturally so much more attractive than everyone else around them even without trying it's very off-putting um so next time you guys see a celebrity you'll know what i mean but i i one other time i saw jennifer garner no makeup and just walking around and she was still like five thousand percent hotter than everybody else there so that's how you know you got a celebrity on your hands more you know yeah anyway that's what i think of when i think of james marston so we opened tonight's movie with a stop motion of burgers assembling before finally seeing the title card in our famous lead ed played by kel mitchell leading with his most iconic line welcome to good burger home of the good burger can i take your order uh it wasn't until i wrote this part here where i mentioned how we follow through with a sequence straight out of better off dead that the the sexual molester Dan Schneider, who unfortunately is in this movie, yes, he's in that and too. a producer. He's in Better Off Dead. Yeah, he's the 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 French girl. She stays with that family. He's the he's the weird kid that's trying to flirt with her the whole time, or just like be himself. That's him. Oh, yeah. Dan Schneider, just quick mention, is a producer on this as well, and he plays uh ed's boss he's also a writer and a writer yeah all i have to say so we can get this out of the way is google it very very sus <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna say anything that can't easily be proven and i'll just say the one thing that can be proven is his creepy ass tweets there's a lot of feet tweets yeah and uh i think i'm surprised an exec at nickelodeon wasn't like Bro, why do you keep tweeting pictures of Victoria Justice's feet? That's probably the biggest bummer about this movie. So I'm glad we're getting it out of the way now. <laughs> Cause I was really I was really bummed when I saw him. And then I remembered, oh yeah, he also appeared in Keenan and Kel in these skits. Like well, he was yeah, basically because the first season of Keenan and Kel, he was, I think, an executive producer and he wrote several of the episodes. Yeah. Okay. So opening scene, Ed. A surrealist uh, nightmare. <laughs> We go zero to acid trip real quick. Talking burgers <laughs> with eyeballs. Ah, I'm fine with fast food. Ah, ah. Woo! Wee! Oh, you know, for a guy that looks like he smokes a lot of weed through this whole movie, not a single drug was used at all during his, uh, well, maybe not his performance, but on screen anyway, he's not taking any drugs. Just super Californian accent, very Bill and Ted, like... Originally, this was the voice that I guess he ended up doing during his audition for all that, where he just kind of put it together and just started doing it and people were laughing at it. And then it ended up coming up again later where he was doing another skit and he was supposed to be a pizza guy and just reused the voice. And I guess that ultimately ended up transforming into the character of Ed for Good Burger over time. Hmm. It, it is pretty funny, though. Oh, yeah. A lot of the stuff he says is perfect for it, too. We'll get it out of the way that I think Keenan and Kel are one of the comedy duo greats. They should be able to stand next to, um, like, Bill uh, and Abbott Ted, and Abbott and Costello, uh, Bob Hope and uh, Bing Crosby, and Keenan and Kel. Key and Peele, absolutely. They're, and the best part is, is like they're they're eighteen and nineteen in this movie. That's nuts. And they 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 hit it, and it just sucks on how after this we don't see them again together for another what fifteen twenty years before they did that that skit on Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon or one of the Jimmy talk show hosts. Yeah, I, I think know. Jimmy Fallon. Yeah. Which, I mean, we see them again just because like this ninety seven they were doing Keenan and Kel I think until, um, I think early two thousands. Because I think there were five seasons. I just found oh, it interesting that Kel kind of fell off the face of the earth for a little while, whereas Keenan just kind of naturally went into SNL. But Kel seems no, I to think like Kel... have his shit together. So Kel, no, Kel went into producing. So I think okay. he went behind the camera, whereas Keenan went in front. Right. Because I think he might have even produced music, but don't hold me to that. This is citation completely needed. I'm not sure, but I know a lot of actors. <laughs> Nick's new segment. Yeah. <laughs> completely um, needed. Pretty sure, at least. He, I know he went into some producing, and I, he was behind the scenes. I don't think as a writer, but definitely like producing some some shows. Mm -hmm. Tim is looking it up. I can see the IMDb ads on the top of his glasses. <laughs> so... 
Yeah, because I know years ago, um, I had heard that he ended up getting out of acting and whatnot because he was focusing on like family and things like that. Um, but evidently, he did come back and do other things from time to time as far as like character voices on like Clifford the Big Red Dog that I guess he got a, nominated for a daytime Emmy for. Um, but he ended up doing other things. He ended up doing a, a writing and producing a movie, Dance Foo. He ended up doing some stuff where he popped up on like Attack of the Show on G4. Um, he had another show also by Dan Schneider called Game Shakers, where it was about a, a kid's video game company. So like he's done other stuff. I think it was just he's been bouncing around to other projects and not ever necessarily like... I will stick myself to this one thing and then just be in the public eye ongoing. Also, what was that movie he was in? The superhero movie? Mystery Men. Mystery Men. That was huge. That movie's absurd. I I don't think I've ever actually seen that movie beginning to end. I just remember he's the kid who can only become invisible if he's, what, like naked and nobody's watching him or something? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but he actually does become invisible. <laughs> so he wakes up from a dream the acid trip was a dream i love the clock goes the alarm clock goes off and he picks it up and looks at him and just says ah a clock <laughs> and then better yet it's like he lives and breathes in his uniform because when he goes to shower he's he's he's, he's in uniform so he's he's doing two birds and one stone with that yeah i love the gag that the hat never comes off it's fantastic well i think the hair was attached directly to it it was yeah. There's yeah. like a there's a blooper later on in the movie where he falls through the vent and you can see like the hat came off and the way that the hat is resting on the corner of the bin that they're in you can it's clearly he's not wearing it anymore but the hat is still there and the the braids are coming off of it so we cut from once he's in the shower we cut between Good Burger and Ed as he heads to work on rollerblades all the while the current customers are growing angry that the counter guy isn't at work yet. So Ed barrels in and takes the first customer's order, who argues with Ed. Can I get two Good Burgers? Oh, sorry, dude. I have to go get them. Customers aren't allowed in back. Just give me two Good Burgers. His reaction to this whole thing, dude, like... Dude, I just can't give you two Good Burgers. You have to pay for them. Like, in the more pissed off the customer gets, I really, really was laughing harder than expected. I agree. But also, two things. One... He would feel at home in Hackers with these rollerblades. Two, <laughs> on his way to get to Good Burger, when he ends up going through the jump roping girls and then gets yes. tangled up and is just dragging one girl behind him. That was oh so my God. unexpected. Hit. And then and her then, head hitting the pavement. <laughs> just the, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> I, I had that. That was my first big laugh of the movie for me was because for some reason I was expecting him to like jump over it on the rollerblades I was not ex I don't know why I was not expecting or just like him. knock him over or something yeah no to like actually drag the girl <laughs> well and then he ends up hitting the the mother with the baby and ends up holding the baby and taking off and going into a basketball court and gets into a scuffle and accidentally swaps the baby for the basketball and somebody dunks the baby <laughs> It was pretty funny. It was very, very funny. It sounds like madness saying all of this from my notes. <laughs> this is a kid's movie. I just, after everything, I just have gold, gold, gold. <laughs> so with his whole exchange with Arliss, the um, customer is getting more and more pissed because Ed is just, he's not trying to be difficult, but this is kind of a common, like a, a reoccurring thing where he takes things very literal, almost like Drax. Like my 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 favorite one is later on when he has another like run in with a customer that's something similar over, you know, a burger with nothing on it. Yeah. But, you know, the guy gets pissed and he's just like, you know what? I can't wait until Mondo Burgers opens up. And then like the camera kind of peeks around the guy's shoulder and you could see like this big building being built and set up. Mondo Burger? What's Mondo Burger? And uh, you could see that it's going to be a new fast food chain that's going to be opening soon. And I guess in, technically it's actually going to be that night. We cut over to the school um, that morning and we see Sinbad living his best days from Shaft, giving his final test of the year. And then Keenan Thompson, playing Dexter Reed, is just staring at the clock, waiting for the summer vacation to officially start. 
All right, people. Two more minutes for the end of the test. I know you're thinking, my brother, why? Why would this man give us a test on the last day of school before summer starts? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because Sinbad is the crown jewel of 90s comedies. This is our second Sinbad movie. I'm not sure why uh, Dexter, Keenan's character, dislikes him so much because he does seem like a really good, engaging teacher. But yeah, does. Dexter just can't fucking stand him. And I, I, I'm really confused <laughs> as to why. I, I mean, I think it, the whole thing is the arc of Dexter being the problem and then yeah. Dexter learning. Go- but then even at the end, he's so antagonistic to Mr. Wheat that it's like, <laughs> man, you you became a better person except to Mr. Wheat. You're still like so <laughs> still a dick. aggressive to him. <laughs> so Never thought of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Because throughout the whole movie, he's Mr. Wee has no, she, he's not doing anything, unless we don't we don't see what happens through the rest of the school year. Maybe he has it out for him, but it'd also be like, you know, from like one black man to a black child. I'm trying to make sure that you are the best that you could possibly be, and that motivational push that Wee is trying to give him is just probably not ringing in his ears. He's like, no, I just want to slack off. I want to do my own thing. I want to have fun. It's like, no, you know, now's your time. This is the time and opportunity to do that. But I'm looking way too far into this. Well, I mean, he even towards the beginning when he stops Dex from leaving um, before he leaves for summer vacation and kind of subtly explains that, like, I know that you have to be cheating or doing something in my class because it's like, wow, you seemed like you were sleeping and you still completed all your work first. So unless it's just a case of kids being kids of, Man, he's on my case. He knows that I'm doing something I'm not supposed to. I can't stand this guy. But he never gets over that. I also wonder if that's just part of like that Nickelodeon brand of humor of appeasing to kids' sensibilities of teachers or the anti establishment damn the Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) You know, kid stuff. (laughs) Kid stuff. (laughs) But you know, like, oh, school sucks, you know, homework sucks. Disenfranchised youth. (laughs) (laughs) but i mean so maybe you know watching this as an adult you just you really feel and knowing how terrible teacher's pay is which also how did he afford his car on teacher's pay (laughs) okay wait so hold on when the car is only twenty two thousand, then like well that's pretty good nowadays considering that's probably oh i looked it up it's forty one thousand dollars today okay so still more than what would be a comfortable like teacher's salary car, um, but not necessarily like he's driving around in a Bugatti. Yeah, I mean, but forty one thousand dollars or that equivalent. I mean, there are teachers that get paid less than that. So yeah, pay so. teachers more. <laughs> yes. So Keenan, I'm sorry, Dexter. Keenan as Dexter pieces out as soon as possible when the bell rings. During the car ride, too, the big cons- discussion that the two of them are having is like the sc- uh, the topic of like a summer job. Like, hey, man, you lucky. My folks is making me get a summer job. And then Dexter's like, see, that's it right there. You got to explain things to parents like summer vacation. The key word there is vacation. See what I'm saying? Funny enough, that's exactly how this whole movie turns out. It's about his summer job as he's driving recklessly with his friend that we all recognize from something else, but we can't quite remember his name. He We're sorry, friend. <laughs> he uh, has a um, a terrible turn, and he ends up crashing into Sinbad's car. So he has a terrible turn because Ed is delivering burgers and comes out in the yes. middle of the road, causing him to crash on his rollerblades. I- I like how, so his friend Jake, uh, who's in the car with him, I like how as he's turning to talk um, about Sinbad and he's like, hey, don't worry, just let me do all the talking. And he turns and Jake is already out of the car running down the street. (laughs) But then it cuts to the next shot of Sinbad talking with Dexter and you still see him continuing to run off into the distance down (laughs) the street. I noticed that. (laughs) That's amazing. So when he gets into the car accident, it is Sinbad. And I love his explanation on how, like... Listen, it wasn't my fault. See this nut on some rollerblades? He skated into my vision sight, and I couldn't see nothing, so I swerved. And then we were spinning around I don't want to hit. And then I couldn't control I don't want to hit. And I just really love Sinbad in this, and I feel like every single one of Sinbad's lines was just completely improv. 
and it was just them two going back and forth with each other. It's just like, all right, subject, you hit his car. You're trying to get out of it. You don't want any part of that, and you need to get the kids to pay. Go for it. Which, like, it's fun to see that Sinbad ends up having such a smash career coming from the 80s into the 90s and all of this. And now he gets to do the role of the teacher and then have up and coming like Keenan got to perform with Sinbad as a kid. Like he's performing across from the same guy who performed with like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Keenan Thompson is in the same conversation as all of those actors as a child. Yeah. Although Keenan's always been extremely talented too. Like I said, I mean, I, I remember seeing him even younger in other movies and Oh yeah. He just yeah, he was good at it from day one, it seemed like. That's why I was proud when I heard that he was joining SNL, like of all the childhood actors to, you know, make it from when I was growing up, seeing him in there and just thinking of like Chevy Chase and, you know, Eddie Murphy and all of the other big big names that came out from performing in SNL and then leading to even bigger stuff. Like, I mean, look at Will Ferrell. He's a, you know, a, a household name at this point, And he had his roots starting off in SNL and mm-hmm. just Keenan is still there. And I say it with some disdain, but then when you mentioned on how he's practically next in line to take over for Lorne, like that's an even higher remark. I think he's even better off doing that. Yeah, I would agree. And again, I I think that's speculation, but it would kind of it, it's like Ken Jennings taking Jeopardy. Like it just makes sense. Well, plus you would think like at this point, even when he started his first year on SNL, he had more sketch comedy experience than probably a majority of that cast of adults. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, I've literally been doing sketches and working on sketches since I was a literal child. Yeah insane absolutely his audition insane. was probably just a formality his audition is he walks in and slaps an all that vhs on the desk and he just says have at it dressed still as pierre escargot they wheel in the tub <laughs> Say a quick shout out to, to the, all that the uh all that um song by tlc ah. so good so they have to strike up a deal um that he gets an estimate sinbad gets an estimate of 1900 dollars to repair his car from the damage incurred by Dexter. So Dexter now realizes that he needs a summer job in order to, to get it. I'll get a summer job. I love every time Keenan has to do something he doesn't want and his just reaction to it. I'm going to cut every single one of those lines in. I just love every <laughs> single time where he's just like, you know, he doesn't want to do it. Like, I'll-, I'll get a summer job. Well, he goes into that, like, voice inflection that immediately just takes me to like a montage of all the stuff from like the Keenan and Kel show and all that. Ah, here goes. Or like, yeah, or yeah. like when he does the the high pitched why. Why? Mm-hmm. Um, at one point, and I'm like, oh, this takes me back to which Keenan he still and does in SNL, especially like when he's doing the game show hosting sketches and oh, does well, he? Those those inflections, <laughs> yeah, he. It's because it's so good. It's so funny. I have to do a, like a uh, like an SNL supercut of all of Keenan stuff because I honestly I've only seen like maybe two or three episodes of SNL over the last ten years, and it's just only because of a certain celebrity is on. Yeah, like I saw the Jenna Ortega one, and I saw the Pedro Pascal one, and before that, I couldn't even tell you the last time I saw a modern SNL. Yeah. So. The first time I saw this, I thought it was the natural progression of, I need to get a summer job. He's going to end up at Good Burger. And then he ends up directly at Mondo Burger next, which this is when I was like, Mondo Burger is essentially fast food Globo Gym. Yeah. Um, the outfits are almost the same. It's true, yeah. I think the outfits <laughs> directly inspired Xenon Girl the 21st Century costumes because you know, they, they, they could have probably could used actually the same be, costumes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was I love uh, how, like in um what Starship Troopers, all of those costumes got used in like other sci-fi shows from Fox. Also, just imagine cooking and flipping burgers and like patent leather. No thank you. Well, that I has to imagine be how much those people would be sweating. Like none of those costumes look breathable. No. So you can only imagine ten minutes into your shift over a hot grill, you're just 
that has to be a human rights violation. It it was just not good. (laughs) It was really bad. We'll we'll skim over the chemical use of you know modification modificationing their their food that they're giving out, but Mm -hmm. growth hormone. Yeah. (laughs) I like how much hassle Dexter gives all of these guys at the the Mondo Burger throughout this because I think this is where it's like okay so he's the problem with Mr. Wheat but now it's like okay we really don't like these guys already that are like yelling at the staff and coming in and bullying around staff that now he becomes this like the the classic like Bill Murray role of you're the smart ass but you're the smart ass that's endearing um Mm -hmm. in all of these things of the damn the man and we meet her he's like the big he's the big bad um who i think also had hair exactly like ashley parker angel from o-town um o-town was a little bit after this oh google him ashley parker angel if you google him you'll recognize you know liquid dreams o-town does this ring any bells i remember o-town yeah so ashley parker angel was the blonde and it was the exact same hair like you know there was so much gel in that that again probably an OSHA violation for him to be near an open flame. Like it was just really, <laughs> it it was just straight up. Um, so that was another kind of flashback on the, just like the fashion and the style. Of, I, I know like in the late nineties, you're starting to get into, especially around 97, but really in 98, 99, there was uh, a moment of like futurism. And uh, cause you know, we were approaching the new millennium. And uh, uh, I, think I believe this... it was the Willennium. <laughs> God damn it. I haven't thought about the Willennium. <laughs> it's at this point that Dexter just uh, gets completely fired from Mondo Burger and gets escorted out. And this is more of like that whining that I love that he does. Like, oh, please, I need to stop. Please, I need to stop. <laughs> I like how at first when Kurt. Um, is starting it with him, and he's like, "You are a piece of me, yeah, extra crispy, please." <laughs> <laughs> there's, yeah, there's lots of quick quips. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, from um, Keenan and Cal in this movie, like just their characters really, uh, they're really good with the comebacks. It's, it's nice. Which I think they land all of their material in this. That none of it just feels like somebody wrote you some good lines that you're just going to read off. It's you are doing the line well that it ends up kind of making that fun. Yeah. This doesn't feel like acting at all through most of the movie, and especially when anytime it's it's Keenan and Kel saying the lines, it doesn't feel like they're acting. It just feels like it's so natural and it's exactly that, where every time they say something, it's just so passable and it doesn't sound like somebody else wrote it for them to say it's just them being themselves and there just happens to be a camera in front of them yeah like keenan actually did hit sinbag's car he can't afford to fix it and now he has to get a summer job who cal mitchell happens to be working at i I think part of it is the fact that these were pre-existing characters and you know as silly and i don't want to say stupid but like as silly as the characters are and the stories are i think it it helps that delivery and it helps that acting if you spent so many hours as that character already you know from the tv show well it's only ed that pre-exists everybody else is fabricated and is, is that's made true for the movie. that's true dexter yeah that's true dexter is new keenan yeah. does kind of play himself in a lot of ways but it's more mm-hmm. of like an arrogant version compared to keenan from keenan and kel it's weird to say his name so many times he was like the straight guy, right? Like in the the Good Burger skits on Keenan and Cal. I think usually he would just like walk in and he was just like the everyday, like one of us. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I don't remember any of the, the Good Burger stuff for the most part on all that. Yeah, I just, the one that he did on like the, the talk show that he played like a construction worker, right? Yeah, because that he ended up instead of playing alongside him, he ended up playing the... Uh, the Arliss opposite. Yeah. But yeah, I think the, it's more in line with his like Keenan and Kel character of the uh, dreamer and schemer, like Ed, Ed and Eddie style, which just kind of fit him like a glove during this. Yeah. 
I love the interaction with the other guy at Good Burger arguing with Ed. This was my favorite uh, <laughs> customer interaction out of the, the show, yeah. the movies, everything. And it I just had goes it written back down, too. <laughs> so, like, if you ever ask for a Good Burger with nothing on it, don't expect it to have a meat patty. Dude, a meat patty is something. You said nothing. Fizz, is a meat patty something or nothing? Uh, Something? I think the and the way that it was ended, and this is how I want to end all of my arguments from now on moving forward, is just I'll see you in hell. <laughs> okay, see you there. <laughs> Hi, and again, that was one of those jokes when I was watching this that I thought you don't get this in a Disney show, you don't get this in a Disney movie. This is what kind of carved out Nickelodeon as being different and a little bit edgier. And there, there are a handful of those jokes in this movie, but yeah, that I actually burst out laughing when he was just straight up like, I'll see you in hell. Um, so that was good. I want to see that in frozen three. <laughs> <laughs> Screw this Elsa. I'm not going to do this until hell freezes over. And she's like, I'll fix that. <laughs> Really minor thing that I'm sure you guys noticed because you're very um, observant. Outside of the window of the of the Good Burger, there was a Blockbuster Pavilion. Yep. And but one thing that annoyed me was you would see it if the camera was facing east, and also if the camera was facing south. It was like always across the street. I didn't actually notice that. I was more concerned about the fact that Dexter just drank eight milkshakes. I was really <laughs> concerned right. about his blood sugar <laughs> level because that was really concerning on how I get it. It's supposed to mirror and mimic that scene of like in a bar where the main character is really depressed and he's got like, you know, 10 shots worth of alcohol in front of him and he yeah. starts talking to the bartender kind of thing. And it's the same thing except it with milkshakes. But like, dude, I'd feel sick after like the third milkshake and you're on milkshake, like pushing like nine, 10 at this point. He's just on the express train to Diabetesville. <laughs> Put me in. Summer job's not the only thing he's looking for this summer. <laughs> Diabetes. Hope you love insulin. I I like the introduction of um, Dex to all of the crew because it's the the whole discussion of hey I'm having a bad day like I just got fired from my job I need to make some money I need to go find myself a summer job and he gets invited essentially by Ed to come work there and I like how they introduce Abe Vigoda as Otis the fry cook <laughs> and all he just says is I should have died years ago and Keegan just says. <laughs> And just continue on. It's well, the funny best enough part with is how Abe Fragoda, the response. Actually, <laughs> the best part is actually how he gets hired. It's like, come on, he could be a fry cook. It's like, well, Otis is the fry cook. Yeah, but he can die any minute now. And that's when the camera just looks over at him and he waves back and he's got like he the, the oxygen, oxygen mask. tank. Yeah. <laughs> This entire thing of convincing him to work there and then with Mr. Bailey and he's like, well, can you drive? Oh, I'm one of the best drivers. Any accidents on your record? Not to your knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> like it's for a kid's movie. It's such a snappy script that's just played so well by all of the actors. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I did think it was funny. It's like the whole reason why he's in this quandary is so like he doesn't have a driver's license and then he ends up getting the delivery job. <laughs> well, he has a license. He'll just have to give it to you next year <laughs> when they put it in his hand. Never really thought of that. I completely forgot about that line, too. Yeah. They, they, he gets out of trouble by getting a summer job, by getting the one position that requires him <laughs> to drive a vehicle starting this whole thing over again <laughs> imagine, imagine mr we learn this it's like wait a minute what what's your summer job <laughs> so he gets introduced to spatch that we mentioned before played by ron lester from varsity blues and not another team movie i didn't i was checking out all of the cast because i was just curious as to like oh where is everyone now and it, i was disappointed to find out that ron lester passed away in 2016 oh. um that I guess it was a like struggles with uh, organ fla failure and whatnot, um, but he had gotten some like bypass surgery because of his weight at the time, 
And then he dropped all this weight and he was like on a TV show talking about the weight loss. But then he, I guess, years later complained and said, it killed my acting career because I was getting hired for all of these roles because of I was the the guy the from Varsity Blues. I was Spatch. I was like all of this. And now all of a sudden I was just like another guy in the crowd. And he's like, I am I alive? Yes, but I would rather have been happy and rich and famous <laughs> it's almost i'm almost like um ethan supley because the same thing he was in a lot of stuff when he was bigger then he cast the weight off and then it's just you don't really see him as much anymore it's really hard to not get typecast oh in Hollywood, yeah I, I remember him he was yeah. in my name mm-hmm. is our all right mm-hmm. yeah. yeah i love that show also there was uh, what's i can't remember her last name but jennifer from dirty dancing she got the nose job and then she oh jennifer ne- you never saw uh, her again. Jennifer Grey. Yeah, Jennifer Grey. Like, she was in everything it seemed like in the 80s. And then she got the nose job. And then it was just like... Hard pass. Yeah, it's you're you're, you're done. And it's... It, yeah, it's really messed up. So It's because Hollywood wants you to be unique. Uh, unless they want you to be exactly like everyone else. And you don't know which it is that they want until you're the other one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's too bad. So the Burger Mobile. Is one of the greatest vehicles. Do you consider this, I was going to say, how would you put this against like the 89 the Batmobile? Batmobile? It's tough, man. It's it's <laughs> tough. I don't know. I actually recently saw um, Batman Returns just for the hell of it. And um, reliving that nostalgia of like, that's my Batmobile growing up. Like that's still to this day, that's my favorite Batmobile. And then seeing the Burger Mobile roll up right next to it. Like <laughs> I wouldn't know who would win in a fight. Do you remember the old like Hanna-Barbera race. wacky racers where it was mm-hmm. like all different cartoon characters racing against each other. They need to bring that back, but do all these pop culture vehicles of like the Batmobile versus the Burger Mobile versus the Speed Racer car versus the, Flintstones the Jetsons. Cars. Yeah. <laughs> The Flintstones cars just get smoked immediately. Listen, they just need a participation <laughs> trophy. Fred is just running as fast as he can right down to like the nubs. <laughs> I actually just saw the Flintstones picture cars uh, the other day when I was at, I uh, did the Universal Backlot tour. And um, yeah, it was, they're so fun to see because that movie was, that should be another, that could be another episode too. That movie is absurd. There was a uh, company that was by my old house and they did um, granite and like different countertops and the company, they since moved um, before I ended up leaving, but they had moved like a couple months before, but it was named like bedrock something. And they had a replica of the Flintstone car out like on the street. And oh. I passed it every single day, and it was really cool to see. Huh. I never like got out of the car to look at it because it was it's right next to the rent the mall, and it's really kind of a headache to try to park around there, especially in that one spot because I just wanted to look at the car. But mm-hmm. it was really cool to see. It was just it was always parked outside, and it was just like right on the grass, and you can you couldn't miss it driving by. Because like, wait a minute, is that oh, it's the Flintstone car? That's cool. <laughs> I need yeah. to do a studio tour. I've 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 been dying to see those in person. Now, like I've seen the YouTube videos, but. Not come the out same. and visit. You gotta go there in person. Yeah, Nick, let's go. Yeah. Oh well, I mean, to. you have to come to the Warner Brothers tours because they have all the Batmobiles. They have all those picture cars. I know. Also, we and can I can actually get the Animaniacs. <laughs> you see you the Animaniacs. I'm gonna go get sorted in the actual Hogwarts by the actual like sorting. The hat. sorting hat. Yes, yep. Please. Yep. Mm-hmm. I was sorry. I'm not a. I'm not an Animaniacs fan. I'm sorry. I was sorted into Gryffindor, and my mom is a Hufflepuff. This She's all weird. makes sense. She's a caregiver. <laughs> she looks like a Hufflepuff. So the Burger Mobile runs over Sinbad's Mr. Wheat, his mailbox, and the chest hair on Sinbad in that scene. Like, is it <laughs> is it real? Do does men's chest hair do that? Is that like I have a, no idea. It does. It's, it varies. It varies quite heavily because you go from looking like you know newborn baby to like gorilla. So um because i love uh, i love chest hair williams was in the category of gorilla because i mean he had i don't think there was a single patch of skin where there wasn't hair on that man's body henry cavill has great chest hair just putting that out there see this is the content you wouldn't get with dean being here (laughs) (laughs) to be quite honest i didn't even notice he had chest hair in that scene until you mentioned it yeah it's 
Sinbad's chest hair is, it's, I find it so distracting. I'm surprised I'm the only one that noticed. Well, yeah. it's because throughout the 90s, I didn't get a lot of shirtless Sinbad scenes throughout <laughs> House Guest or First Kid. Or, Not uh, to mention just the Jingle super the bright mailbox that he's going to glamorize before it gets run over by uh, <laughs> by Ed. I like how, other than the intro, he has so many little like cameos throughout this movie, little segments that are just him getting his day ruined, and then it just moves on to the next scene. <laughs> So speaking it's of nice, that though. night, <laughs> that's that's exactly what happens here. He gets uh, his mailbox run over. He's like, "Oh, what the hell!" And then uh, <laughs> we cut to that night. Kurt and his posse show up to Good Burger to taunt them out of uh, to taunt them of the impending doom that's opening tonight across the street because Mondo Burger is opening. The red carpet's rolled out, cutting the ribbon and passing through the doors to Mondo Burger, where the electricity of just everything going on between the live band, the lights, and just, I guess, operating causes Good Burger's electricity um, breaker thing to just kind of explode, and it overloads, and it kills the power to their whole restaurant, forcing them to close early. I like to imagine this film taking place during the same night as Nakatomi Plaza, when they cut power to the grid. <laughs> I, I just, I imagine, can you, like, can you imagine attending a fast food burger joint opening in a tux? Like, there were men in tuxes in that scene. You don't? So, <laughs> did anyone else find it surreal in a 90s kids comedy that they were playing presidents of the United States of America during one of these montages? Which one? No. They were playing Man by, um, so after they end up doing the the big ribbon cutting ceremony and whatnot they're playing presidents of the united states of america and yeah, it it's like threw a threw me because i was like this seems so weird being here <laughs> but not in a bad way just an unexpected way mm -hmm. yeah because here we see uh mondo burger just raking in the cash they're giving drawers of money to kurt oh that was president back the to burger Mm -hmm. yeah and then good burger is just kind of like you know watching the class um you know or you know nothing except that ed breaks otis with his rollerblading and dexter then puts two and two together and realizes that it was ed who caused his crash yeah oh this is the part where he's like you almost broke my ass <laughs> he's like i think you think you can get me to a hospital i think i broke my ass <laughs> that's good Ed Don't. reveals his special sauce during lunch with Dexter. And this is when I first noticed the Blockbuster Pavilion in the background across the street. Mm -hmm. um, but I like how they have everybody try it. And Otis comes over and he tries the sauce and he does. It makes me glad I'm not dead. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned him opening the sauce and it's splattering everywhere. I thought it was definitely prevalent and all things Nickelodeon in the 90s it just brought back like the that slimy color yeah and and like that humor of just there being food mess like everywhere there's just lots of food um it makes me think of like Double Dare 2000 with like the fake pizzas and you'd have to look for the keys under or oh, the flags yeah. under the pepperoni and like you know that there's a lot of that type of humor and you see it later on in the movie too with like the ketchup and mustard guns that he shoots like i'm thinking man kids just i'm glad it went in this direction instead because the other kind of comedy the 90s is known for is that like gross out humor mm -hmm. and the same double dare having like you got to pick the nose and like all yeah. the boogers and stuff that, that a lot of this stuff would cover i'm glad that was not present at all throughout the yeah. burger because I never liked that aspect of the Nickelodeon growing up. That was gross. I still gag even when I hear someone like, you know, doing stuff with their nose. It's just, I can't, that's, that's my like gag reflex. I just can't do it. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Tim, for, for uh, those of us that can't see, Tim is His pretending to pick his gold. nose. <laughs> it's, it's up into my brain. The old uh, <laughs> knuckle trick. <laughs> I'm like a magician. Later on in the movie as well, too, uh, when we skip ahead, I'll mention it. Uh, it. I also got some Double Dare obstacle course vibes 
but we can get to that later. But yeah, I, I appreciated that, that, uh, the use of the physical comedy with the, the sauces and stuff. Side note, if the, the actual price that he owes now is $2,500, we're assuming at this point we have, I don't know, 60 days of summer before we're back to school or whatever it is for his summer job. That means he would have to work like six out of seven days a week for eight hours a day at, slightly higher than minimum wage for 1997 for him to make enough money and that's him literally just no taxes just flat rates paying directly into mr weed's bank account so he makes he he makes so let's just say he makes five dollars an hour for 40 hours yeah, a week he needs that's 625 almost, that's that's almost a thousand dollars a month almost maybe well, he, closer he to says... like maybe 900 in the movie, he, he breaks math, down everything. But... He says, I'm making $5 an hour, and it was... I just threw a number out, because I figured five sounded right. Yeah, no, he, he actually... And then he says, like, four days a week, or... And then he said, like, his exact salary. It's almost oh, like he knew we were going to talk about this. <laughs> but if that's the case, he will never, like, he will never financially recover from this. <laughs> he needs to be doing six days a week at, like, eight hours a day, at like 625 in 1997 to be able to make back that money and that's not even him saving and like using it it's just paycheck he's literally handing Simbad all of his signed paychecks i mean also that's not even including any government taxes because whatever he made take 25 percent out of that so unless he's like not going to claim income tax but i feel like that's a plot for good burger too <laughs> well, honestly dexter's the type to i don't think pay taxes so Good Burger 2, dot, dot, tax evasion. <laughs> I, it they also Mr. fighting Bailey out about his summer job. Looks like he just pays his employees daily from the cash register. So I don't know. So it makes sense then that this is why Dexter jumps on the opportunity when he realizes that Ed's sauce is delicious. And yeah. he I, wants to make it proprietary. He wants to keep it a secret. And he drafts up this absurd contract for Ed that Ed can, he's, but he reads the contract and he says, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm. I know some of these words. <laughs> I still <laughs> use that gift to this day. I hate seeing like a wall of text being sent to me as an explanation for something that could have been said in two sentences. Yeah. And I just, I'll usually reply with that exact thing. Like, mm-hmm, yep, mm-hmm. <laughs> when mr bailey told ed that hey your sauce is, he said they start selling the sauce at the restaurant and it ex like it, it their business explodes it's just they're getting customers left and right way more than they were getting before and they're getting so much money in that mr bailey tells him for every burger sold you will get 10 cents that's insane mm -hmm. so at the end of their first i think their first day he made 67 dollars so that's over 670 burgers yeah. to be sold in one day. That's like, I didn't even know they had that much meat in the back. <laughs> I also love just like fries and shakes. Yeah. And then, so that's why, that's why um, Dexter takes advantage of this. Um, and he wants to get a cut of that, that extra money. So he has, Ed signed this contract that basically promises 80% of the additional profits to Dexter and only 20% to Ed. Although he does, uh, Dexter does remind Ed not to just start rambling off the ingredients to the sauce to everybody. Nefarious or not, it makes sense that he doesn't because it, it would hurt the business if he leaked it. Exactly. And I think for more ways than one, not only would people like mi like mirror it, but it also gave me like, were you on TikTok or heard all of the like the controversy with the pink sauce that happened? No. Oh, oh, yeah. But wasn't it like not health grade or something? I thought it was like. Yeah. Well, she didn't. She, she basically made like refrigerated sauces and didn't refrigerate them and just ship them as is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like me opening a can of mayo or like a, a tube of mayo and then just Ooh. like using it for a day, then sending it to you unrefrigerated. No. Because the bottles were starting to ex like expand from bacteria growth. It was disgusting. <sighs> and 
that almost gave me the same vibes at first because it made me think like, dude, this guy is just carrying around a jar of sauce on him at all times and not refrigerated. <laughs> the botulism or really adds to the flavor. <laughs> yeah. Then the other part too is like, don't tell anyone your sauce because they're probably not going to want to eat it after you tell them what's in it. <laughs> well, for some reason, the first time I saw this, I thought there was going to be a reveal at some point that it's like his sauce isn't really a homemade recipe. It's like, oh, I add this and this, and then I add like another existing sauce. Um, so it's just, no, Ed's just, it's a good cook. I think at one point, the only thing we see him add is evaporated milk when he's making see it. pickles. And pickles. Yeah, whole ass, like not even cut pickles, just complete uncut pickles. <laughs> so lemon good. juice. Yeah, he says there's lemon juice and ketchup, I think. So, man, now I'm getting with hungry. how much money, with how much money Good Burger is making, Mondo Burger is growing suspicious, and we see them spying from on them from across the street. And here's where Kurt tells his cronies to, you know, send someone in to get a hold of that sauce and the recipe for it. Oh, and they have a heart to heart moment here, where you know Ed wants to hang out with Dexter, so they go up on the roof, and I think it's funny in hindsight because, hey, you want to hang out tonight? Yeah, sure. He goes up for not even two minutes and then he leaves. <laughs> but that's not how the hey, scene plays I do out. That. <laughs> but in reality, I thought it was kind of funny. Uh, Ed shares what he likes to think about, you know, like things that are sticky. <laughs> uh, while Dexter reflects on how often he's moved as a kid and then how his dad left him. and he, But he also his dad left him and he had a pretty badass yo-yo yo that was given to him. Um, Ed goes off the rails a bit as he does throughout the whole movie. Like, you know, my first word was like trousers or like, man, like, what's this line? Um, you know, like, I don't remember what my dad looks like either, but at least I get to see him every day. I give up. I'm going home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that cracked me up. <laughs> Also, I feel like those yo-yos uh, were really popular in the 90s as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The yeah. light-up ones. Um, well, yeah. I feel like there was, like, this yo-yo boom during that time mm -hmm. where all of a sudden everybody had, like, the, the X brain and all of these other ones. Yeah. I remember having, like, seven, a, a double bag of yo-yos, that third grade show and tell. I just brought in a bunch of yo-yos of like my X brain and the killer B or a super B and all these things. And I was like, yeah, I could do tricks. <laughs> and it was the coolest I'd ever been throughout my entirety of school. I just had a bunch of pods. I've been thriving off that high since then. <laughs> I just had a bunch of pogs. That was Left my, pogs. yeah. Our generation's jacks. Yeah, true. I think I felt we were too young for it. I didn't, join the pog thing until like the tail end of it and by the point by that point i had no idea what to do with them i just remember uh, my brother and i were really into them and around the same time too magic the gathering had just gotten like really crazy popular so he was collecting a lot of those cards and then i think pokemon got huge shortly thereafter that so we're we're talking like this is 97 98 this is like anywhere from like 96 to 98 like all those years these were the popular things i remember Man, the summer to be alive going <laughs> to see men in black and good burger breaking open a pack of pokemon cards playing your pokemon red versus blue <laughs> makes me have regret i just love that tiktok where it's like you see a girl playing with beanie babies and then the same girl like kicks open the door to the bedroom that she's in it's like older version of self and she's like it's not the beanie babies you want to keep it's the Pokemon cards. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, although my mom, so my my mom is cleaning out her attic and she's been giving me all these boxes of old photos. I'm just hoping one of these days I'm going to crack open one of those boxes and find a bunch of my old Pokemon cards. <laughs> Forget that. Look for, look for your brother's magic cards. Yeah. I, I, uh, I'll keep an eye out. We'll see. Yeah. Early <laughs> mid 90s. Probably got some good stuff in there. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Got a black lotus in there. Shit. And he's called Power a Nine. That's it. Phoebe's going to college. <laughs> All expense. The cost of just two mana. Here in this heart to heart too, we do see like Ed is just like 
he's kind of a dimwit through the whole movie. I don't think he is with how quick witted he is with all of his his lines whenever someone says something to him. But just deep down, he's just he's a pure of heart. Yeah. Like I feel Ed would be able to lift Mjolnir. Like that's just <laughs> yeah, who he is. I agree. Actually, yeah, like I just agree. Pure, absolute pure. I agree, and because then that that that's starting the yo-yo conversation. It it's just starting the fact that he's invested in like getting to know Dexter more like that. It's starting to set up that guilt. Like we feel the guilt on behalf of Dexter. Like it's starting to build at that point of like, dude, you are taking advantage of a really good person. And it gets so much worse. And like the final, like I wish it was the final nail in the coffin, but yeah, it sucks on how he has to be such like a shitty person through the whole thing. And then finally like learn his lesson at the end. It's like, dude, man, you had plenty of opportunities. Mm -hmm. The only reason you're like turning back now is because you got caught. It's, it's stupid. Yeah. So I think the next note I had was we get into the cameo I already mentioned earlier of Carmen Electra, right? Nope, that's actually Shaq. Oh, they get confused over often. <laughs> yeah, I was like, which a, one played on the Lakers? They get a VIP food delivery, and they rush off in the Burger Mobile like they're in the stadium in the car. And then they get out of the car and run into the locker room, and it's Shaq. Delivery! Shaq! And it's just, I do want to, we've digressed a lot, but the only last digression I want to go into anyway is Shaq is just one of those celebrities that truly is amazing. I don't personally like basketball. I, I, I hate the sport, but when it comes to all the different like movie celebrities, music celebrities, sports celebrities, Shaq is the only one that I feel is the most wholesome out of every single one of them out there. Mm -hmm. Every single story I hear regarding Shaq, it's like he stops what he's doing to give money to a kid to be able to get them whatever the hell they want. Like, mm -hmm. like that thing with like Mila Kunis. He's like, what are you getting your kids for, for Christmas? And she's like, don't worry about it. And he's like, all right, we'll call me Santa Shaq. It's like, Shaq, what'd you do? What'd you do, Shaq? <laughs> and it's just, he's always, ne he never thinks about himself. He's always looking out for all of his fans. And he takes the time to recognize every single one. I always had a good feeling about him. And then seeing this just reminded me of like, and plus too, you see him so young in this. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah. The, he's the Mr. Rogers of basketball is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the last person I would expect being like, you know, the the fucking what's his name? Shazam. <laughs> it is crazy how much smaller everybody looks instantly when he's on screen. It's like everyone looks yeah, normal sized no one... throughout the movie. I think it's what Yao Ming is the only one to make him look like a normal human being. Yeah. <laughs> everyone else is just super tiny. Even the rock next to him is super uh super super small. The Shaq cameo is when I kind of fell down a rabbit hole because I was like, oh, Shaq, probably around this time he was doing like Kazam. And then I was like, but Kazam, but Shin Sinbad also did a genie movie he called didn't. Shazam. A... Oh, it is Shazam that he did? He didn't. The movie doesn't exist. It's like a Mandela effect thing. That's the thing. Like, I don't, I, I've seen that Mandela effect so often. I always knew it was Shaq. I remember going to the theater. I remember getting the, the CD soundtrack for it. I always knew it was Shaq, and I never understood where people thought it was Sinbad for whatever reason. He was in, like, some kind of skit show where he did play a genie. Well, also, I think, it, like, in my case, I knew Kazam. I saw Kazam with Shaq. Well, not with Shaq. He was in it. I didn't. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> that would have been cool. But the... I thought there was another genie movie with Sinbad from early so in the too. 90s. Yeah, and it, I was just like, oh, I guess it must have been popular because of Post of Ala Aladdin. And only Kazam exists. The other one was just people thought it did until they did like a college humor skit of him doing like, oh, lost footage from Shazam years later. I think I'm from the other universe and I didn't join y'all's until... I was 13 or so because I, I don't remember that. And I always wondered like, mm, cause some of the other ones make sense to me, like fruit of the loom, having the, like the cornucopia behind it or um, 
the Berenstain Bears instead of the Berenstain Bears. Like I, you know, I could have sworn to definitely, but the Shack one always like oh, I don't agree with that. I never <laughs> ever felt it, but it is a really popular one. Yeah. So I guess in 2017, Sinbad teamed up with College Humor uh, for April yeah, Fool's that was Day. The skit. Yeah. Yeah. And they they said, "Oh, we found the long lost Shazam." footage which i love how now if you just google like sinbad shazam you'll see image searches pop up from that skit so unless you <laughs> delve further into people. it you'll just immediately think like yeah, yeah yeah no yeah i'm right okay and then move on to something else <laughs> yeah interesting so bum, 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 bum. <laughs> the more you know yeah so while Shaq's eating the burger he's giving the restaurant some like indirect publicity because it, it is on live tv and Kurt just happens to be watching that broadcast and he just he's furious because not only is he losing Mondo Burger to Ed Sauce, but now he's watching it on live TV. So he's just deciding to, you know what, if I can't have anyone else get the recipe for me, I'm just going to, you know, cue Thanos and do it myself. <sighs> so while Ed's seen skating, doing another delivery or doing whatever Ed does, he gets hit by another car. This is what the third time, second time, this happens. But it's this time, it's a GMC, um, and I can't tell if it's supposed to be fancy or not. I think it's supposed to be like a nicer car, but again, it's nineteen se- it's nineteen ninety seven, so it's still looks shitty to me. But anyway, continue. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, Kurt who's driving this GMC, and uh, another one, another funny line. It's like, can I give you a lift, Ed? Oh, I don't know, dude. I weigh about one fifty. <laughs> <laughs> Kurt drops Ed off at Good Burger and, you know, the whole time trying to get Ed to work for him, but it doesn't really work too well. Or it's just like, you know, I'm going to leave you with all this info. Like, think about it. Come work for me. What did he say? Like $9 an hour or something? $15 an hour? It was a lot of money. Even now, that's still like, especially, in, you know, mid 90s to be making that much at a fast food place. Like, I'd quit my job in a heartbeat. <laughs> It's here Ed gives Dexter a yo-yo, and it's the exact same one that Dexter <laughs> talked about when they were having their heart-to-heart, which this is where the guilt should have finally did him in, and he should have stopped the contract, but nope. Um, at Mondo Burger, here is where Kurt orders for them to send in Roxanne to get the recipe, and this is played by Carmen Electra, and she enters the restaurant and tries to tries to flirt with Ed. But of course, everything you know goes over his head. Every single thing that she said, and um, she does manage this scene. By the way, mm. sorry to interrupt. This scene when Carmen Electra walks into the restaurant towards um, Ed just feels like a direct copy of the Foxy Lady segment uh, from Wayne's World, and <laughs> like with the music playing, it just seems like a direct homage. Um, so I thought that was good. Who is that Claudia Schiffer? You want to get out of here, Darth? <laughs> I don't know. You don't have any <laughs> what is it? It's like it's kind of cold. Like I don't have any gas and you don't have a jacket. You need a light jacket. <laughs> That's yeah. Claudia Schiffer, right? I think it was. I think so, yeah. yeah. She's yeah. such a babe. <laughs> Swing. <laughs> she asks to do like a, a date with him and he's like, huh, okay. And then he gets um Dexter to like ask out Monique. He doesn't want to because she's gonna be like, nah, he gets rejected again, but when Ed asks for Dexter, she's like, yeah. And you could see like the change of heart. Mm-hmm. And then that's when like, you know, Ed, uh, Dexter starts swooning like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. She's going to go with he's going to go with Monique. And they all go mini golfing. But Roxanne wastes no time trying to get that secret sauce from Ed. They start playing, but every attempt is foiled from Ed's savant athletics and causing her to sustain some pretty heavy yet comedic injuries. Dexter flirts with Monique once they get to Good Burger, or back to Good Burger anyway, after the date. And she reveals the reason for her sudden change of interest. So because of Ed's newfound friendship with Dexter, made her second guess her initial reaction. It's because of Ed is why they went out on that date. Dexter even gets a kiss from her, but the tinge of guilt from knowing his subterfuge and stealing from Ed will change everything. Roxanne, on the other hand, continues to try and flirt with Ed, but his self-defense skills lands her in a body flip on the ground. <laughs> that cracked me up. Hip toss. She walks back into Mondo Burger, complete with casts and crutches and just telling Kurt, I quit! 
that what I loved about um, Ed doing the um, martial arts move of just instantly flipping Roxanne over his shoulder and then he was like oh sorry I got scared like it was just an instinctual thing like out of nowhere <laughs> he's self just like skills. reflex like all of a sudden he just like reactivated <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> his code words mini golf mondo um also <laughs> that is a very real miniature golf place that we can go to when you guys come it visit looks us. so cool yeah it's in sherman oaks i would like to go there can we get corn dogs i don't know i don't remember what i <laughs> ate there but it's a very real place so and sometimes that does i always wondered how to get the dog in the corner <laughs> oh what does she say to that i'm trying to remember it's like it's magic or something the mystery that's plagued mm -hmm. mankind for centuries. <laughs> I always thought, even as a kid, like they can just go over and ask them. <laughs> the next scene has uh, all that's very own Lori Beth Denberg playing a customer in line during the next morning. But instead of getting pissed off at Ed and walking out like the rest of them, she actually short circuits his brain because of how fast she's filling or like telling her her order. <laughs> Talking hard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she's giving her order at like Mach 5 speed. And it's just so well delivered. As well as telling a and story. And she had to be I she had to too. be all of 21 at the most when filming this cuz she was just as young as they were. Oh yeah. Um being a character and all that. But the fact that like she pulled off like <laughs> acting as like a, a European mother in her mid 30s like <laughs> <laughs> just flawlessly um and again that's just part of the the frustrating piece of like Lori beth not being able to fly as high as like keenan for example in her career when she's definitely talented and uh, oh on the regular good meals i need two of the good burgers to have ketchup mayo mustard lettuce tomato but no onion i've got an interview this afternoon let's see that takes care of everyone but uncle leslie who doesn't eat meat but of course he does eat dairy so i don't get it uh, let's get leslie a good chick with some good fries and a good fruit beer all to go but i would like to have my beverage while i wait now tune me up my my the only favorite that i didn't see do anything afterward was katrina I don't even she remember She didn't make a her. cameo or do anything else. She played um, Bob, uh, not Bob Ross. She played um, Ross Perot. Oh, yes. With the, the nose makeup or whatever. Yeah. She was my favorite or, or one of my favorites from the show. Um, Lori Beth always stole the scene. I always loved it whenever she was on. And then, of course, you know, Keenan and Kel. Mm -hmm. Josh Server was another one, but he made it in this anyway. I think he does a lot of producing credits and writing credits too. I had a crush on him. I thought he was so cute. Who didn't? Yeah, he's mm -hmm. he's a cutie patootie. Um. Hmm. Dexter <laughs> goes uh, in the back room. We see Dexter like clock in while with Monique, and I had a cringe for a second. I'm like, man, they had to do like manual time cards. Yeah. That's brutal. Yeah. But Dexter tries to be playful with Monique, but she immediately is giving him the cold shoulder, and we find out that. That night when he gave Monique his jacket because she was getting cold. Forgot your jacket last night. Oh, thank you. And this fell out of the pocket. Oh, uh, this? This is just all it is. All, all right, it is. it's just the contract you had Ed sign. You know, the one where uh, you take most of his money, the money he's supposed to get for his sauce? No, yeah, but... She's furious about the whole thing. But of course, you know, it's not like... I'm not mad. I'm I'm disappointed at you kind of feel. Yeah. She's like, no, I'm not going to tell him. Don't worry about it. Cause I know if I tell him it's going to break his heart. And that, that hit me like, mm -hmm. damn, that's, that was, he deserves everything that happens to him. A brilliant execution of a guilt trip. If ever there was one. Yep. So, and it kills me cause he almost does it. So he's fully racked with guilt at this point. And he goes outside to talk with Ed who's comparing the good burger with the Mondo burger. He walks over and he starts trying to talk about the contract, but that's when a stray dog comes up. And I love this bit of <laughs> this uh, with Ed translating for the dog. Like, <laughs> oh, what? what? <laughs> Four clowns? <laughs> well, the car's broken down. <laughs> They're in trouble. <laughs> And that dog is not talking and to you. And then, of course, boy. Dexter's like, dude, man, there's no clowns. Like, let me talk to you about this. 
but Ed is just f- focused on like, oh, wait a minute. You know, maybe if I give him like the food, he'll go away. He gives him the Mondo burger and the dog ignores it. And then he gives him the good burger and, you know, the dog scarfs it down. So the dog can tell that there's definitely something sus about the Mondo burger. And it makes Dexter want to check out exactly what Mondo burger is really up to. This is another great bit where they decide to dress up as two ladies and they walk into Mondo Burger completely in drag (laughs) and they try to sneak into the kitchen. So, and then hmm? I was just going to say, I like how following the scene before we jump over to the, um, them going undercover that we get to just randomly see all clowns standing (laughs) around their car being like, where did that dog go? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> also, doubly, I like how he says, what boy, four clowns, their car broke down. And if you check the IMDb goofs, they say, he said four clowns, but clearly there's five clowns at that car. Like it wasn't a, <laughs> like it was a script error and not that like, clearly he should have been able to tell there were five clowns. <laughs> I mean, he's a dog. Yeah. He can't count. No, Maybe one of them was excellent. a mime. Maybe it was like, technically, I'm right. There are four clowns. One of them didn't finish clown college. <laughs> he was uncredentialed. <laughs> Thanks, Spot. You keep bringing it up at every opportunity. He didn't pass his clown boards yet. <laughs> He's still studying. In a, in a year, uh, you know, we can, you know, I can get it to you in about a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cal Mitchell can pull off a mean drag like (laughs) he looked fantastic (laughs) and i love how when they remove their costumes to reveal who they are uh ed is fully committed (laughs) wearing the lingerie (laughs) lingerie. (laughs) like that was just so smart it was it was very it's a fun fun and just that that quick that quick moment of silence when everyone in the room just looks at just Ed absorbs it. and just seeing Keenan's face like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> Don't care, ladies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, laugh it up. Uh-huh. Yeah, Kurt tries to one last time to get the sauce from Ed. But at this point, he's just done with them. So he sends them to uh, a psych ward called Demented Hills. <laughs> and I guess uh, hours go by because back at Good Burger, the crew were starting to grow worried because both Ed and Dexter went missing. I don't know the timeline of all this because some points where I think they should be in bed, they're not. They're like out in the community area. And then I don't know. But the boys are now mixed in with the rest of the Demented Hills population. Ed hits it off brilliantly with another patient who's played by another cameo of the movie, Linda Cardinelli, which, fun fact, is her very first movie debut. Thank you, Tim, for that one. While Dexter is not doing so well with the other patients. Don't you stop eating the card and quit poking me! Crazy! I love the little birds in, that, in Linda Cardellini's hair, like that that were just like sitting in that like a nest. <laughs> no, that was that. I that just whole love scene her was lines great. through it. Yeah. Have small space aliens ever landed in your brain and told you to break into the zoo and free the kangaroos? Not that I recall. So what you in for? I got in trouble for breaking into the zoo and freeing <laughs> all the kangaroos. Freed all uh, the kangaroos. <laughs> I like how. There's like certain actors that you see early on and sometimes it's like, well, clearly they're meant to be a star. And there's other ones that you see and it's like, yeah, they were no better than the rest of them. Like, I don't know when it happened. Linda Cardinelli, you see her hair and it's like, oh, no, yeah, clearly, even though this was her first feature film, she had chops. Okay, is it Cardinelli or Cardellini? Cardinelli. Cardinelli. Oh, shit. There is an N. Yeah. I'm the worst. So that night, Mondo Burger strikes Good Burger. Is... And uh, they try to poison the Ed sauce that they still have available in nope, the kitchen. Nope, I'm right. Sorry. Otis. <laughs> Wait, that? what? It's Cardellini. Wait, what? Sorry. Card- Corrections to Cardellini. Cardellini. 
Car- <laughs> Holy shit, it's another Mandela effect. <laughs> Cardellini. Linda Cardellini. No. Oh. <laughs> Cardell in Cardellini? Cardell Cardellini. 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 <laughs> I'm cutting all this up. It's fine. No matter what, it's not Cardinelli. So I've been wrong for all my life. Ed hits it off with another patient, played by another cameo of Linda <laughs> while Dexter isn't doing so well with the other patients. Revised history. <laughs> this episode night, brought to you by Mondo, the Mandela Effect. <laughs> that night, Mondo Burger, uh, Otis, played by Abe Vigoda, catches them, but Mondo Burger kidnaps him too and sends him off to the asylum as well. Uh, when they throw Otis in the cell and uh, they all catch up on what everything is doing, they realize they only have about four hours to head back into the restaurant to stop it from being served, which is funny because it looks like he got captured at like one o'clock in the morning. So, I mean, like what? Like four hours? OK, <laughs> so I guess 30 minutes from then when the sun is fully risen. Um, all the patients are in the shared space once again, and here is when the captured boys use this opportunity to hold a dance party to escape, led by another other than uh, George Clinton. <laughs> Which I love that it's so 90s that all of a sudden they would just have like a dance music sequence yes. in this movie that somehow doesn't feel out of place. It just works. Mm-hmm. It but does. I, I also like how directly before the dance scene, Ed has the giant guy in the straight jacket that he ends up letting loose and he runs off fra- like out of frame and you just hear everybody start <laughs> screaming and they're like, he's loose, he's killing Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> I, I first I thought, wow, this dance sequence is so unnecessary, but then you realize it's perfectly necessary. It's how they're able to evade the security Plot and get the keys. Based dance. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh i liked how especially how keenan was able to do like dance moves to take out the guards like oh man you know that shit hurts Mm -hmm. like an elbow to the rib cage like that you know they ain't breathing for the next five minutes he leans down breaks both their necks your brother did that to me once i snuck up on him in high school and he elbow checked me in the chest couldn't breathe for like 20 minutes afterward that shit is (laughs) painful i don't know how some people like in action movies like oh he just took like 15 shots to that chest or like you know um i think i forget what movie i saw but he got kicked in the nuts like six times like dude man i don't know how you're standing i really don't know how (laughs) so a lot happens here so they escape the uh mental asylum they have the big straight jacket guy help them by Throwing, throwing them. Keenan out the window, which and oh, then which... <laughs> and then Ed just jumps out of the window that's still not broken. Well, I thought it was going to be like a a one flew over the cuckoo's nest thing, and then I love how it's just, well, can you get us out of here? And he just grabs them, spins them, and just throws them clean out. And then Abe Vigoda immediately is like, "Okay, here I go," and he jumps yes. out, and you see the clear <laughs> stunt double of just flying through the air and rolling. <laughs> That whole sequence was great. Yeah, because then I, I just loved it when Ed just was like, okay, I'm going to go too. And you think he'd jump out of the already open window, but he just busts through a different window completely. Yeah. It's I thought fun. that um, that uh, Linda was going to get, um, like, follow through with them, or at least, like, the straitjacket guy, but they never did, so. Although, at the end of the movie... They never show her escaping, but all of a sudden it's just like when they're celebrating and it's, hey, they saved the day. She's in the crowd in Good Burger standing behind like Mr. Bailey. Oh. And they never explain that like, oh, and she got out. That, <laughs> Ooh, it's a deleted scene. It's Oh, is it? I did. I, I don't know. It could be. I did have the junior novelization for the movie. And they had one deleted scene in the book that wasn't in the movie. And while Kurt was trying to do as many things as possible to get Ed to give him the recipe, one of the things was he gifted Ed a chestnut horse. So because, of course, the horse is chestnut colored, he named the horse Blueberry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the only thing that I actually remember like happening in the book versus what happened in the movie. 
I didn't know there wasn't a, a book accompany, accompaniment. I can't speak. It was the nineties. They had a they had a junior novelization for everything that came out. I I just like to imagine that there it was never a planned for a deleted scene of how she got out. It's just all of a sudden it's no, she is that crazy that after all of this happened, she just found another way to just walk out whenever she wanted to. <laughs> and also I'm pretty sure that scene was shot because if I'm not if I remember right, there was a that was one of the junior novelizations that had pictures in the middle like showcasing like certain scenes and stuff and now nick will read you the junior novelization of good burger now available on audible and kindle no 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 just uh there was a deleted scene with a horse but i'm getting mixed things with like horses and bob's burgers and not what i'm trying to find i'll dig and i'll find it later oh my gosh tim just sent us a link to ed sauce from good burger okay i have to try this Oh so, my goodness. dear listeners, you won't be able to probably join in on this, but I just found it online. Um, I will try making it this week. And um, <laughs> Nick, if you want to do some burgers, we'll try the, we'll try to reproduce a good burger. Yes, I'm here for that. I just want the sauce. I mean, the burger. Honestly, you remember like Mr. Max and I think Goodies. I think Goodies is was the closest thing to a real good burger. I feel yeah, that it's just like it's nothing special it's just nostalgic of it's the burger that you would get at every backyard cookout or every like school field day of them just flipping burgers all day good slice of tomato some crisp lettuce throw some sauce on that some cheese call it a day you know what? i want to make this this weekend i'm gonna make burgers i think we we're planning on having burgers anyway i'm gonna i'm gonna freaking make this sauce i'm gonna make ed sauce if it's good we'll share it for everybody <laughs> this is the closest i can find for the the closest I can find for the horse thing is um, Kel did an AMA on Reddit and someone asked him about the, because in the credits, apparently there's a horse, there's a, on the set, there was a horse wrangler, but there's no horses in Good Burger. So like, <laughs> was this a deleted scene? You have any idea what the hell they're talking about? It's truly a mystery. And he's like, wow, yeah, it was a deleted scene. Ed delivered a horse. No, Ed delivered a burger on a horse while being chased by Kurt or trying to get away from Kurt or something. Mm -hmm. You'll have to try that uh recipe color looks right yeah so they get back to mondo burger and they want to prove that they're using an illegal additive in their burgers to make them bigger and i hope i'm not jumping ahead too much but this is the other part i was talking about that kind of gave me double dare 2000 guts you know nickelodeon obstacle course vibes uh of them scaling how do you expect me to get up there Oh, it's easy. You just jump on a burger, jump on the fry, and then you hop on the cup, and then shimmy up the straw. What, what is this, American gladiators? <laughs> <laughs> jump off the fries and go down the straw. Um, so that that definitely uh, gave me those kinds of vibes. So again, just things that kids liked, you know, just oversized things that you could crawl on and like a jungle gym, and it's just fun to watch. So, um, did you guys notice though that when they slid down the straw and landed inside in the kitchen, the whole point, the reason why they were there is they were looking for the additive, and there was an entire shelf of the additive right behind them, and they were like, "Okay, let's go into the other room and find it," and there was just like tons of boxes of it right behind them. I I also didn't notice that. <laughs> I was distracted by Kel's hat coming off with his hair. Yeah, see, I didn't notice that. So that's the only thing I ever see in the scene because it's like, ah, oh, they the blooper. <laughs> I like the the Dex acting as the decoy of him drawing off all of the guards with the ketchup and mustard gun. Yeah, like he's the condiment king from Batman. So they chase him off into the 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 wilds. And that's when Ed ends up kind of going to steal the liquid or steal the canisters, and it drops into the meat vat. And then he kind of decides to just start pouring all of them into the meat vat, which turns out to be a very smart decision based on his whole explanation, like his Kaiser Soze explanation at the <laughs> end of this movie. Which, I'm like, oh, I guess he's not dumb. Which Kel definitely was reading from a cue card when he gave that monologue. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. 
but we're not there yet but yes um oh we pretty much we are. pretty much are yeah he, he dumps he dumps all the stuff in there and even just the look on his face when it's happening knowing what he's gonna say later like it was an accident that he just mr magooed his way into winning the day because mm-hmm. just like his his reaction is like 4d chess in comparison to just like you're a klutz and you knocked it over and you stole an empty vial and just like oh it wasn't empty when i found it mm-hmm. and then just seeing um keenan's reaction like the, f- the hell are you talking about and then you know all of the stuff instead of it being just a single drop into the the meat the meat grinder it ends up becoming like you know the the burgers are becoming the size of like car tires and yeah it's exploding. like a meat detonation just, yeah yeah they spontaneously combust they essentially just explode and then the explosion the giant statue burger on top of the mondo building <laughs> crushes mr wheat's car for good i felt sorry for him now i like though how when they're so yeah this because this is when dex goes out and he has half of the money to give to him and he hands it to him and he's like here's half of the money i'll get you the other half but he does it smugly that it's like, Mr. Wheat hasn't been terrible to you. <laughs> you hit his car, later destroyed his mailbox. Twice. And now, granted, this wasn't intentional, but like you now destroyed his car completely. Yeah. So mm-hmm. there's twenty two thousand dollars. We lost car. over it. But during the uh, the asylum escape when they're in the ice cream truck. His it's like a running gag through the movie where it's just like, hey, you forgot about Mr. Wheat? Well, we didn't. We're going to destroy his mailbox again. (laughs) Yeah. I think at this point, I did notice his mailbox wasn't like, there's no post hole digger that was done. He was just like sticking it. (laughs) Yeah. You'd figure at least you would kind of dig it into the ground a bit. So if you try to run it over, you you can't. Yeah. But eh, poor guy. I would have attended his class. I do, however, like how after the police are carting away the Mondo boys, the Kurt's going to jail dance that they do. Um, I think it was shortly after this, too, that, in my opinion, the funniest joke of the entire movie was said by Ed. So funny. In fact, I think it elicited a genuine laugh from Keenan, like breaking character. (laughs) <laughs> so I really think, yeah, but when he said, no, see, is it because I'm black? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not going to be partners. You don't want to be partners. <laughs> is it because well, I'm just black? It, after like, all this crap, that's when he finally decides to just cut the contract and destroy it. Like, we're, we don't have to do this. We can still be partners, but we don't have to do the contract. Yep. That was just yeah. brilliant. I just like Keenan's reaction of, no, it's, I mean, <laughs> you do know that I'm, you know, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I just, it, I feel like, I feel like that was ad-libbed or something because Keenan's laugh. Or they laugh, wrote it and didn't tell him that it was going to be in it. Yeah. because yeah. No, I think that was ad-libbed and just. It was so funny. Because Keenan's pretty quick about doing a lot of spontaneous lines too. Yeah. And just with how dumbstruck he was, like that was the best he had. No, that had to have been <laughs> that had to have been um improv. I do like the Ed explanation though on why the um when he's walking away and explaining Sure, see I knew if I took the can, there was a good chance I'd get caught. Huh. Then I thought, even if I did take the triumphal thought to the proper authorities, huh, Kurt would hire some high-powered attorneys who would dispute any charges brought against him or Mondo Burger by manipulating the legal system. And the way that America's court system is congested these days, it would have taken months to convict him of anything. So then I thought, I'll take the matters into my own hands and just pour the triampathol into the meat supply and let Mondo Burger be a victim of its own foul play. (laughs) (laughs) It's like all of this stuff that's like, he's not wrong about any of it. Nope. Like the best bet was probably what he did because at the end of the day, they probably would have just used money to just bury them in court fees and things. Yep. Oh, what if that's what Good Burger, Good Burger Two is? It's like court, Kurt's out of jail, <laughs> and now instead of doing like Mondo burgers, he's doing like tofu burgers and like the Impossible Burger. Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought it was going to be like he gets out, but now he's like ripped because all he does is just work out in prison. He now is a gang. It's like no, I'm not going for burgers. I'm going for you. It's like Dolph Lundgren like comes out, like he plays it's Kurt. Like, <laughs> it's like Cape Fair. 
just Kurt's like sitting in a movie theater just laughing. <laughs> So they they return to the restaurant, and that's when the uh, the ska version of "I'm a Dude" kicks in, and they live happily ever after, working at Good Burger, and the day is saved. I love this movie. Um, I didn't grow up on it, so there's no nostalgia factor to it for me. I think it's just a good film. Mm-hmm. I I looked at the tomato meter, and I know that tomato meters are not trusty for older movies that predate the website um rotten tomatoes but i think it was something like like it was rotten for the official critics and then it was uh certified fresh by the audience and i think that tracks here of course it is so i agree with tim i think it's a great movie i think it holds up um and yeah, just because the jokes are so quick and they're not sugar coated. Um, and I, I think the acting overall was just really fun. You can tell like in some of the scenes they were having fun. So I'm again, I'm really kind of glad I that my husband bailed and I was able to revisit this today. So yeah, like you said, I think it's any of the the acting that may like it either ranges from good or there's ones that's a bit corny but it's not because of any bad acting i think it's that's the characters that they specifically wanted them to be that way because it's like this heightened surreal sense of absurdity throughout this film because we're living in a feature film all that sketch essentially Mm -hmm. that i think like right down to like spatch and whatnot it just it works yeah through yeah. the whole movie too, I don't ever feel like there is like for a lot of kids' movies, especially around this time, a lot of them didn't feel like they had the same acting caliber compared to other major production movies. You know, not to say that this can go like toe to toe with Air Force One that released like the same day. It could, but it, I feel it could. It it really. I I watch it every year. It's like my summertime movie. It's like the I was torn between like this and the Sandlot hearing the sequel get announced recently made me want to watch this over the sandlot and it's just uh, it's a feel-good movie it's very funny even as an adult and i've always felt like the jokes kind of gotten better with age because now i'm not looking at it like a kid anymore i'm looking at it as an adult and i'm now laughing at different parts of the movie for you know not because i'm laughing at the movie but it's like that that was a really well done or well timed line just a lot of the clips that i entered in or like you know i put into the movie too like i think is like the highlight reel of the whole movie too it's just so many good lines in it that yeah you know for how quick ed's able to react to some of the customers and just his interaction between him and keenan just it's it's so well done mhm Agreed. Rotten Tomatoes can suck it. I'm sorry. (laughs) Because anything controlled by people is inherently bound to be bad. So I don't trust Rotten Tomatoes. It it really does bother me how much it like critics pan it. It's not a it's not it's not a movie for critics. Yeah, it's it's not trying to be an Academy Award winning film. No, and a lot of them aren't in the way that they're like, oh, like I, I know you guys didn't prefer it but the mario movie is a really good example of it critics are like oh this is bad but then like it's overwhelmingly positive for the people like what were you expecting Mm -hmm. it's an animated kids movie that has enjoyment for adults in it yeah it's kind of like a pretty low bar you know yeah i don't know i loved the actual Uh, animation in that movie i just felt like and i loved i loved keegan michael key as toad like loved him um I, and I, I think Luigi was great. Charlie Day as Luigi was great. I just feel like some of the casting was off, especially for Peach and Mario. I just, it didn't need to be Chris Pratt. I don't know why they put him in everything. It's really annoying. It should have been Jeremy Irons. <laughs> <laughs> it's me, Mario. <laughs> well, this was a fun journey down memory lane. And also, it's always a pleasure chatting with you guys. So thank you again for having me as a last minute replacement. Of course. (laughs) So Spice World? Or no. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if Dean keeps canceling, then uh, it might be Spice World. (laughs) Brink. Brink. (laughs) 
Thanks again for coming along for the adventure known as Good Burger. As always, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at Screen Refresh, or email us your own movie memories at ScreenRefresh at gmail.com. If you like the show, help us out and leave a rating, review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to help others find us. For Laura and Tim, I'm Nick, and we'll see you dudes again in a couple of weeks for Rule of Thirds. Ah, a clock. I already have the stinger. <laughs> what, what is it? When oh. Kel yells out fudge during the ice cream truck sequence when they're escaping. <laughs> when was it's that? It's just the way that he's like throwing all of the different ice creams. Oh, and then yes, it's just yes, like, yes, yes. Fudge! And then he throws the last one. Yes.